our final week before youth camp, so there's a lot of preparation out the campground that will be going on and, and uh, preparing for youth camp and anticipating the Lord's going to meet us at youth camp and help young people. But I could really use your help this week, and um, I know there's a number of things that will be taking place at the camp, some work, labor that will be, ha- be being done. And if you can come out, lend a hand, it will be very helpful. Tuesday they'll be doing some final cleanup and some cleaning in some of the dorms and such what. So if you can help out at 3.30 in the afternoon, we'll, they'll begin started then in the cleaning part of it. Um, and uh, appreciate all those that have helped so far. It's a big undertaking at the campground. And uh, I, can't, I can't do it by myself. I can't do it with just me and Brother Larry and my dad and Brother Joe and Jay and Anderson and Chris. And I can't. It takes Brother Adair and Sister Adair. And, oh, man, we go on and on. It takes every one of us. Yes, it, does. it really does. And as hard as every one of you have worked, can you imagine if you didn't show up, that hard work would fall on somebody else's shoulders. That much more work would fall on somebody else. Man, so we go on and take that another step and say if we have more people that show up, it takes a little bit of the hard work off of other people, right? Amen. So uh, do what you can to be a help to us, and I know the Lord bless you. Amen. If the Lord will bless you for giving a cup of cold water in his name, okay, for getting out there and working, laboring on the campground to prepare for youth camp, I believe the Lord will bless you for that as well, right? Amen. So help us out this week, and then, of course, youth camp's next week. Youth camp is next week, and that starts on Monday evening. And, of course, you're all invited to come out to the services and be a part of the services. Encourage you to come out, be a part of uh, all of the the day services are at 10 uh, in the morning. The evening services are at 730. Come out and um, be a part of the services at youth camp, okay? And... uh, just one other note, Saturday night, there'll be no service here at the church as we prepare for youth camp, no service on Saturday night, and uh, then on Sunday, we'll be having a uh, church from Savannah, Georgia, Brother Ryan Ralston's church will be with us, his youth pastor, Brother Robert Kelly, will be preaching for us, and uh, so we look forward to that, they were here with us last year, and it was a great blessing to us, they had so much fun, if you ever, if you ever, if you, Robert Kelly, he evangelized for a while, Brother Larry, you would love him. He knows every restaurant. It's amazing. You tell, you name a city, and he, he automatically says, I'll tell you, oh, man, I'll tell you, there is a restaurant downtown there. You go down this way, and he can name this restaurant that he's gone to, and he can tell you the best what they're known for and the food, kind of like our resident Brother Larry here. He's our, he's our go-to man for food, and uh, but he just – so he he's got this place in St. Louis already pegged out for this trip. Last one of it last year they had another one they went to. He's got one uh, planned out for their trip this time. He knows food. He knows food. So you gotta love a guy like that. I mean, no wonder he's called to preach. Man, praise the Lord. So they'll be with us on Sunday. All right, Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, the Lord's good, isn't he? Hallelujah. Book of Proverbs, chapter 16, one verse, verse 18. Of course, it's a proverb, so it's a verse that you know, probably, and should know, very aware of. Okay? There's a, there's a great imposter that goes with us everywhere we go. He's so clever, he is so clever that he can even deceive the devil. Now think about that for a minute. An imposter that is so clever that he can deceive the devil. Anybody know what I'm talking about yet? An imposter that is so clever that he can deceive the devil. He is the master of all illusion. He has even turned angels into demons. Uh, Trivia, okay? Got something for the next bulletin there, Sister Heather. All right? It's turned kings into animals. 
right? Turn sheep into wolves. It's very elusive, this imposter. is a deceiver for every person. Okay? It, is, it affects every one of us and works. It is, is without shame. It clothes itself in the thoughts, emotions, and wills of those who trust. But the ones that trust, he betrays them. What are you talking about, Brother David? What are you talking about? What, what is this great imposter? This great imposter is just a small thing called pride. Pride. It was able to deceive Lucifer, right? He fell to the deception of pride. Angels fell to the deception of pride and became demons. Kings so lifted up in their own pride that they became an animal. That's right. Pride is such a horrible imposter. If you trust it, it will betray you. It will clothe itself in all of any thought that you have. It can get it can entwine itself in every thought. It can attach itself to our very emotions. Pride, it is, it is so elusive, but yet so obvious sometimes. Right? But it's deadly. But it is deadly. Read this verse, verse 18. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Fall. I was reading this week and a man was talking about failing and falling. Now we know that pride can lead to our failure, right? Pride can lead to failure. But what the Bible says, pride goeth before destruction. Now there's times that I have failed, but it hasn't destroyed me. We've all failed. And sometimes it was pride that brought us to our failure and was the source of our failure. But it was that, that failure did not, was not my destruction, thank God. But even in my failure, the grace of God was able to lift me back up, to restore me, amen, to bring me back. But even though pride might have been uh, instrumental in my failure, it didn't destroy me, thank the Lord. But what the verse tells us is, pride brings destruction. That seems to me much worse than a failure. Much worse than a failure, that that pride that works even after we have fallen. Pride is not just content to trip you up. Pride is not content just to make you fall. But pride wants to work to destroy you even when you're down. Pride wants to work to bring about your destruction in your life. You see, it is pride that keeps us from getting up. It's pride that makes us, makes us uh, believe, convince ourselves that we haven't even fallen. Right? It's pride that makes us feel like there's nothing wrong. Pride convinces us that everything's okay. Pride tells us that you're no worse than anybody else. Pride makes us feel like that in them, in them, even though we have failed, that everybody does it and there's really no need to try to recover from our failure. Pride brings about destruction to those that have failed. I, well, I guess I will just want to warn you today, hey man, that sometimes we need to be very careful that we do not let pride destroy us. Now, I understand that it may cause us to fail, and you need to ask God to forgive you and get back up and keep moving on. But don't let pride destroy you. Don't let pride continue to destroy your life. 
See, there's people that they have, they've got too much pride to admit I'm wrong. Too much pride to say, I need God. Too much pride to say, this is a problem I can't handle. It's pride that don't want us to fall on our face before God and beg God for help and to beg God for mercy. Pride does not like to beg. Pride keeps us in the pew when we know we need to be at the altar. Pride is what makes us cover over our sin and gloss over our sin, even as the Spirit of God is convicting us of our sin. Pride makes us excuse sin while the Spirit of God is dealing with us about our sin. Pride. Pride is such a destructive force. And it works in the lives of so many different people. It is a deceiver. This is a de- he is a deceiver. That's what pride is all about. He has many hats that he wears, but it's, but it's all about destruction. He comes in many forms. He will attach himself to a pure emotion and a pure thought and corrupt it in your own mind. That's what pride does. Pride works to bring about destruction to us. Let me just talk to you about pride. Pride, is there's a self-defeating pride. That's the pride that keeps us from doing better. Okay? Keeps us from doing better. When we are doing well, we don't want to do any. We say, well, this is good enough. We're doing, but is there room for us to grow? I'm good enough. Do I really need to get things right with God? I'm a good person. I'm a good man. Amen. I'm a good woman. I live good. But do you still need to get right with God? Do you still need to find forgiveness? You see, when pride, it compares us to everybody else. Pride makes us look at one another and say, I'm no worse than he is. I'm no worse than she is. And pride begins to work in our own life when really we need God. We need God to forgive us. And so therefore, pride begins to defeat us. Okay? Amen. Even on our best day, pride, amen, makes us feel like that we are worthy of any of God's blessings and all of God's goodness when really we don't deserve anything that God's given us. It's pride. It's pride that prompts us to think more highly of ourselves than we really ought to think. Right? Pride is so deceptive. It makes us think more highly of ourselves than what we really are. Right? Man. But at the same time, it makes, us th- it makes one person think, or it can even make the same person think, that I'm much, you know, much better than what I am. But at the same time, it can fill us with self, so much self-contempt when we don't live up to our own expectations. It's all pride. It's pride that when we fail, we look at ourselves with disgust. It's still pride working in our life. The ego that causes us to be overly competitive on some occasions can also keep us from trying in other occasions. It's still pride. It's still pride. You know, the person that, that wants to get out there and excel because they are proud, And to get out there and show that, hey, I'm going to hit the ball farther than anybody else. Or I'm going to get out there and I'm going to make more money than anybody else. That's pride that works in them. But it's pride that also works in the person that sits on the sideline and watches everybody else play ball. Because they are so proud they don't want to get out there and admit failure in front of anybody. It's also pride that makes somebody say, you know what, I'm not even going to try. I'm not even going to try. It's still pride that is working in your life. Pride is very deceptive. Pride is very deceptive. Pride causes us to be meticulous about our appearance. You ever saw somebody that was just, I mean, they were so put together, right? Everything was perfect. And you in your mind even thought, they are so proud. They are so proud. They've got so much pride. Look at them walking around. They've got their 
They don't have a wrinkle anywhere on them. They are, everything on them is starched and pressed. That's why they're walking like this, you know. I mean, they have got everything. Every hair is in place, right? I mean, everything about them is just perfect. They are so proud. But do you know pride can also do the opposite? And cause us not to care what anybody thinks about us. I don't care. The person that comes and that don't even, don't even make an attempt. There's just as much pride involved in that in somebody's life. It deceives us. It's pride that causes, causes us to call attention to all of the other people's mistakes. Right? That's pride. Oh, look at them. Look at them. Look at all their problems. Look at all their mistakes. And that's pride that causes us to do that. But it's also pride that leads us to believe we don't have anybody, any reason for anybody to be critical of us. That's pride. It's easy to point your finger at somebody else and say, look at all their problems. But it's hard for us to make, well, maybe there's some area in my life. Right? Pride is also that arrogance that causes us to think we can change our life at any time. Any time we can change our life. But it's also pride that keeps us from changing at all. Right? It's pride that says, oh, I can do, I can change my life if I wanted to. I could, I could do, I could change, I could be like anybody else. I've, if I wanted to, I could change. But really, it's pride that keeps us and says, I'm not going to change. I'm not going to change. That is pride. When the Spirit of God deals with you, amen, and you say, I'm not going to change. I'm not going to change. That's pride, my friend. That's pride. See, pride, it's that thing that, that conceit that allows us to be preoccupied with our own problems. But it can also become, help us to become oblivious to everybody else's problems. That's pride. We are overly consumed with our problems. And we have become, we, you know, there's some people, they rejoice in having a problem. Oh, good, I got a problem. Somebody's going to give me attention. They rejoice in it. Oh, thank you, doctor, for that diagnosis. I know I'm sick, and I'm, oh, I'm so thankful I'm sick. Now somebody will care about me. Is that not pride? You say, no, people don't really do that. Oh, really? There are some people, man, they can't wait to get out of the doctor's office so they can start calling people. I'm sick. What are you bringing over for dinner? I man, they're just waiting for everybody to, to gush with all kinds of sympathy and all kinds of caring and love on them. That is pride that wants that. But then when somebody else is hurting and when somebody else is in need, they back off and they don't care at all. That's pride. Pride is very deceptive. Yeah. Pride keeps us from asking other people for help. That's pride. And there's times, I am not too proud to tell you I need help this week. I'm not too proud to tell you, all right? Amen. No, but pride sometimes keeps us from asking for people for help, right? But then pride also sits back and says, nobody's helping me. Nobody's going to help me. That's pride. Pride sometimes admits that pride seems fatal? <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it makes us seem like pride is fatal, and then other times we know we are proud, and we're just saying, well, this is just the way I am. It's part of it. The pride that keeps us from admitting that we're wrong can also lead us to berating other people and putting other people down. The pride that makes us realize that we've made a mistake are not admitting to our own mistake, but it points out everybody else's, right? Pride causes us to be prayerless. Think about that. The reason why do you not pray? Could it be pride? 
I don't need God. I don't need to call out to the Lord. When we don't pray, are we not, are we not saying we are self-dependent? When we fail to call out on the Lord, are we saying, I've got this under control. I really don't need God to intervene in this situation. I've got under But when we pray, are we not coming before the Lord and saying, Lord, I need you? So your prayerlessness, is it not a sign of pride in our life? When we say, Lord, I'm, I can do this on my own. Because you know what? When you finally get something that you know you can't handle, you do pray about it. That's when you start praying. So all the other times, it was your pride that was keeping you from praying. Right? right? Amen. But it's also pride that will help us say to others, I'll be praying for you. I'm going to pray for you. Right? Is that we, won't, we don't pray, but the pride rises up and says, I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you. Pride works in our life. Pride is that self-sufficiency that drives workaholics to make themselves indispensable to everybody else because they want to feel like they are so important. But then it can cause a person to get lazy and to assume that everybody owes them and that everybody needs to work for them. That's the same pride. It's pride. Pride, that conceit that causes us to disregard the feelings of others, can also cause us to use tears to play on everybody else's emotions. Right? Pride, that self-interest that causes us to parade our success, but prompts us not to admit any failures in our part. It's pride. It's pride. What does the Bible talk to you? You know, when I look at many people's lives, sometimes I'm telling you, we, get, we say, oh, I'm not, I don't have an ounce of pride. If you say, I don't have an ounce of pride, chances are you are proud. And you're proud of the fact. If you wear your shirt, I'm humble. It's not that pride. If, you, if, you, if you've got the hat that says humblest man in the world, hey man, does that not speak to itself that you are proud? We have to be careful that pride does not work in our life because not only will pride trip us up and make us fail, but pride will destroy us. Pride was as deceptive and it makes us think that we're all right when we're really all wrong. Pride makes us find the faults in others instead of finding the fault in my own life. Pride even makes us feel like, that, you know what, everybody around me is a sinner. Why do I need to pray? You need to, pride keeps us from realizing our reliance upon God and our need for God in our life. Pride makes us feel like we can do it all on our own. But pride also helps us, makes us think, you know what, I'm not going to take any help from anybody. Not even God. Pride will destroy you. Pride will destroy the thing in our life. Pride is very ironic in a lot of ways. Right? The Bible says that God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. When you're dealing with God, there is no room for pride when you're talking to God and when you want God to work in your life. And you have to be careful that pride does not enter into the picture. There are some people, the only reason they pray is because they have pride. They're proud of the fact that I am praying. You say, well, that, how can that be? Look at the, the scripture gives us an example of the sinner and the publican praying. And one man prayed with a haughty spirit and very proud about all that he had done. And he prayed loud and boastful. But the other man said, God, have mercy on me. Forgive me, Lord. I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. And that is a, that's the humble spirit that God is looking for in our life. Amen. You say, I've got myself into this mess. I'll get myself out. Don't let pride destroy you. Humble yourself before God. 
Humble yourself before God. Say, you know what? I know I'm not good. I know I'm not a sinner, but I'm going to make myself better so I can be acceptable for God. Amen. That is too much pride. You need to come to God humbly and fall before Him and say, God, I need you. I cannot change myself. I can't do anything, Lord. I need you. And it's pride that wants to buy your way into, the, into salvation and it can't happen. Amen. It all only comes by falling on your face before God, humbling yourself before God, saying, Lord, I am a sinner. Forgive me. Forgive me. Amen. Pride wants to blame your mom and dad. Pride wants to blame where you was raised or how you was raised. Amen. Humble. Come humble before God and say, God, it don't matter how I got here. Lord, I just need your help. Forgive me. Forgive me. Man, to come humbly before God. To come humbly before God. Amen. That is where we will find, amen, that God can minister to the needs of our life when we come humbly before Him. Pride is very deceptive. If pride can deceive devils and angels and kings, pride will work in our life as well. Man, you know what? Sometimes we justify pride. And there's really no justification for pride. Amen. Humble yourself before God. Amen. Humble yourself before the Lord. Amen. I know that every one of us, amen, like to hear people say good things about us. Right? People like to hear people say, you look good today. You look nice today. People like, we like to hear people compliment us on our, on our actions, on our deeds, and, and say thank you and, and show gratitude towards us. We like that. We enjoy that. It's part of our nature. Amen. But guess what? Amen. There is nothing good in me. Amen. It all comes from God. Amen. And that is the attitude that we need to have. It's all by His grace. All by His grace. Amen. It's not anything of us that we should boast. It's only God and only by the grace of God that we are where we are today. Come humbly before God. Come humbly before God. Amen. When we pray, we need to search our heart that there is no pride in our life. And Lord, but I come humbly before you. Humbly before you. Amen. It's not going, I know failure, it happens. But pride does not have to destroy you. Maybe today you feel like, you know what? I've failed. You say, that's, I'm being humbled, admit I failed. But you can let pride keep you from praying. You can say, oh, I know I'm, I know I'm a sinner. And that's good. And that's, that's very humble of you to admit that you're a sinner. But pride will keep you from calling out on Jesus to forgive you of your sin. You can say, well, I know I've made a mess of my life. That's, that's a humble statement. But pride says, you know what? I'll dig myself out of it. I'm going to pull myself up by my own bootstraps, and I'm going to make a go of it. And what really what we need to do is rely upon Jesus. Put your faith in the Lord today. No matter where, where, where you're at, who you are, it don't matter how long you've been saved, don't let pride be your destruction. Don't let pride be. Stand with me if you would this morning. Amen. Let's bow our heads for just a moment. Lord, I ask you, God, that you'd speak to somebody's heart today, Lord. God, somebody that may be experiencing failure in their life. Somebody, Lord Jesus, that may feel like, God, that they've failed and Lord, they know they failed. But God, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would help them realize, God, that they need you. God, that they cannot come boastfully or with pride in their heart, for pride will drive them away from you. But God, if you would help us, Lord Jesus, to humble ourselves. Recognize, Lord God, that we failed and that we need you now more than ever. 
God, that we need you to lift us up. We need you to work in our life. God, I ask you, Lord Jesus, speak to their hearts now. God, we'll give you glory. We'll give you glory. Pride does not have to be your destruction. It may have been the cause of your failure, but it don't have to be your destruction. And maybe you could call out on God today and humbly ask God to forgive you, to help you in your time of need right now. Why don't you ask God to help you? Why don't you ask God to help you? heads bowed and our eyes closed now, right now. And would you slip your hand up and say, Brother David, man, I realize I need God. But I don't want to, I don't want pride to destroy me tonight today. I want to come to Jesus. I want the Lord Jesus to help me. Is there one that lift your hand? One that lift your hand and say, Brother David, pray for me today. I may have failed, but I don't want to be destroyed may have been my own pride that put me in the place I'm in right now, but I don't want my pride to destroy me. I want to humbly ask Jesus to help me right now and to touch my life and to work in my life. Is there one that lift your hand and let the Lord speak to your heart today? Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Church, I wish that every one of us would come to this altar today and let God begin to search our heart, search our life. Lord, don't let there be any pride in my heart that would lead to failure. God, I pray that you would humble me, Lord Jesus, before you today. Every one of you, would you come right now? Let's come to the altar. Let's let God begin to work in our hearts. Amen. Let God begin to speak to us today.
Like it's done.